Hi friends and welcome back to my channel. For those of you who are new, my name is Tammy Ernest and I am a long arm quilter. And here on my channel, I like to share customer finishes as well as my own personal projects. So today I'm gonna to continue on showing you some of my early quilts from my days of doing hand guided quilting. And then I have updates on my cottage temperature quilt as well as my quilt along that I'm doing with uh, my quilt circle membership. We're doing the Somerville pattern. So I'll have updates on that and then a whole slew of customer quilts also. I just wanted to start out today and say thank you for watching. I so appreciate all of your kind comments and uh, the emails I receive. You are all so fun. Uh, I just feel like you're all friends. Uh, I even enjoy meeting some of you in person. Uh, this past weekend we did a quick 24-hour trip up to Wisconsin to take our son back to college and lo and behold in a Culver's restaurant <laughs> I had somebody come up to me and say that they watch me. So hi Sandy, uh, thanks for introducing yourself. She didn't want me to share her picture because she had been traveling all day and I totally understand that. So, but uh, Sandy, thanks so much for introducing yourself and it is so fun to meet all of you. You are all so kind and um, just thank you, thank you, thank you. So, like I said, we did a quick 24-hour trip to take my son back to college. Last week was so much fun. He was home for spring break, um, and we did a lot of fun family things. One of the things we did was Friday night, um, it was the opening weekend of NCAA basketball tourney, and our family enjoys sports. And um, one of the things we did is got the whole family together for a game night, and we did a whole... Um, theme around concession stand foods and um, we did a mascot matchup game and uh, just watched a lot of basketball and we all are in we fill out our brackets just for fun and we're all um, vying for the top there and um, for a little bit I was in first but I'm slipping down through the ranks um, as the weekend went on so it was just so much fun so much fun as a family and um, I'm going to show you some some sports related quilts in just a minute that I did in some of my early days of quilting. But I just wanted to thank you for um, watching along and um, and encouraging me. I thank you for all your kind comments about my family. Um, if you're new, I'm the mom of seven kids, most of whom are grown, um, one in college and. Um, special needs son still home with me um, but the others are pretty much grown and on their own or getting married this year we have three grandbabies coming this year and um, I share a whole lot more about my family not so much here on YouTube not so much on Instagram but mostly in my weekly newsletter so if you'd like to get some close-up pictures and um, and see more of what's going on with our family here on our farmhouse we just we live on 27 acres uh, in the middle of rural Indiana um, just a hobby farm just uh, love the the country and um, and enjoy uh, being out here living out here raising our kids out here but if you want to know more about my family and weekly updates then you'll want to get my weekly newsletter there's um, a link down below where you can sign up for that and I'd love to hear from you also I love to get pictures of the quilts that you're working on and hear your quilting journey that is, uh, is just incredible I love to hear how people got into quilting or got back into quilting and their own family traditions. So anyway, enough about that, but uh, if you wanna hear more about my family, you can join my email list. So it is super windy outside today. So if you hear some things banging around, it's just the wind blowing the porch swing on the, on the front porch and uh, just banging some stuff around. But spring is in the air. We've got daffodils blooming and a little buds coming out on the tree, so it's so close. Up in Wisconsin, they were still having snow um, little bits of snow actually in Minnesota my daughter's visiting um, her boyfriend this week and um, they were under a sh huge snow um, storm and so we actually flew her out a day early because it was um, some, um, some rough weather coming in so hope you're safe where you are hope springs on its way where you are um, and uh, the blustery winds are sure a sign of spring around here so let's start out with some quilts. I mentioned this quilt to you last week. So um, this is one of my early quilts. This is still one that we use every night on our bed. I love the colors of this quilt, but this was early on in my sewing journey. And um, this one I actually did as a kit and I, I dug up and I found the pattern. Well, yeah, I guess the pattern. 
it's in pieces now. <laughs> this was a Moda kit called um, Path Back to the Porch, Porch Swing by Brannock and Paytick. I have no idea if this is even available. I love the colors of this. I'm pretty sure my mom gave me this as a gift, um, as my thinking, and did this whole thing as, um, as a large quilt. Let me see. We have this on our queen size bed. It's a, it's a tad bit small, to, uh, but it works really well. Um, this is a fat quarter bundle of porch swing fat quarters by Moda. Additional light colors for the, the blocks the borders and the binding. So I know I received this as a kit, but just love this one. It's all done, you know, like square and a square, it just builds on the square. And then you have the red uh, sashing around with the gold cornerstones. I love the colors of this. Um, just love, love, love it. So this is the quilt that I took to my mom's. And when she had a long arm quilting machine, I did not, I had mentioned last week how I had given her several quilts that I had made for my girls and she quilted those herself. And then it came to the point and I said, mom, can you just teach me how to run this thing? It was doing self-guided. Um, I said, can you teach me how to run this thing so that you're not standing here doing all my quilts all the time? So this is, I believe, the one and only quilt that I did on her long arm before purchasing my own. Um, I was addicted right from the start and, and, um, and bought my own at that point. So this one, all I did was a loop-the-loop. -loop. Let me pull this in closer so you can see. This is all part of the journey. This is how I started out. Maybe the backside would be, <laughs> and I have to show you the backside because... All right, all I did was a loop-the-loop. -loop. I had never done anything on the long arm, so let me show you down here first. I had never done anything on the long arm. I had watched her, and so all I did was like a meander, but with loops. That's all I was doing. But the first pass, I notice, if you can see this, is very, um, almost like rounded rectangles and the reason is I did that first whole pass with evidently the the um, lock on now in those days it was just kind of done like um, by magnets and so I was really fighting with the machine evidently I didn't know any different it's the first time I'd ever used a machine thank goodness I didn't break the thing but I did that whole first row with um, the lock on, probably the horizontal lock, the way it looks, because it looks like I was able to do vertical pretty well, but those horizontals are really straight. I don't know, I don't know. I had some sort of lock feature on that whole first pass. And then my mom said, oh, oh man, you're fighting that thing really bad. So let's um, take that off. And then you can see my loops got a little better. <laughs> So that's all, that's early quilting. That's how I started, just doing loops, tried not to cross my, over myself, but you can see, I mean, there are mistakes. If you search through here, there are plenty of mistakes where I um, crossed over designs or got myself in a pickle and had to, to work myself back out, but that's, that's early stitching. That's where I started. Very first piece that I long armed myself on my mom's machine. This is a uh, tan color thread that blends in with the top and the back. Did a lot more colors of thread when I was first starting out. So still used every day, love the colors of it. And then I purchased my own long arm like we talked about last week. And last week um, I showed you my girls' quilts that my mom had done. And I showed you Stitch in the Ditch that I had done on my domestic sewing machine. But once I got my own long arm, then I started experimenting. And let me pull this one away so you can see some of the new, some of the first quilts that I did on my own long arm. So my first long arm I purchased used and I really didn't do a whole lot of research. Um, not that I recommend that, but I'm kind of one of these shoot from the hip kind of persons, <laughs> people. And um, I found one that was close, that was in a um, reasonable price range and um, we went and picked it up and it was the day after Thanksgiving. I can remember that. Left the kids at grandma's house and uh, we traveled um, over to Illinois. It was probably a three, three hour trip, four hour trip. And uh, we traveled over there the day after Thanksgiving and kindest lady, she showed me, she left it set up so that we could see how it was put together. She let me run, you know, stitched on it for a while and then we tore it down and brought it home and set it up here. So not that I recommend that, maybe it's better to do some research, kind of see what brand you enjoy, go to some 
um, quilting events where the where the dealers are set up so you can try different machines but that's the way I started out and thankfully it worked out really well I had that first one it was an HQ 16 I purchased that in 2011 had it for nine years sold it in 2020 when I upgraded to a digital machine but it worked really well so anyway I got it home and just began practicing so one year I remember for that was Thanksgiving it was Thanksgiving that we picked it up so this was probably Christmas of that same year I made um, some quilts for my for my girls again this was uh, Christmas gifts simple piecing all I did was uh, large squares again I was using fabrics that I had kind of like I showed you in my boys' quilts last week as well um, and it may have been the same year. Maybe I did the boys's, those the John Deere ones that were all the same, and then the, did these for the girls. I can't quite remember. But um, easy piecing. I used what I had. I'm sure this was denim left over from something. This is a, fl a gray flannel. This is just a white print. And then I did some appliques. So this one actually says Colts down there. We um, live very near Indianapolis, so I just did my own little Colts symbol and just did letters. Um, diagonally down, very similar to what you saw in the boys' quilts with their names last week. So just large squares. This is a large throw. Um, did a, oh, it looks like a flannel on the back, but let me show you the quilting. So where I did just the loop-the-loops on the red and brown quilt, this one I decided to do more swirls. And here you can see, I used a gray thread and just did swirls in and out. Nothing fancy and it's not even that pretty. <laughs> um, but this is how, I was one of those when I first got my, my machine. I did a few times where I would put um, just fabric on there and practice, but I'm not one that likes to do, um, to waste my time. And so I would make table runners or I would do quilts and it's like, this is how I'm learning. I'm going to learn as I'm working on something that's useful and not just something that I'm gonna throw away later. Um, and I've always been that way. I just, I, I wanna be doing something productive. So this is not pretty um, and it's not, it's not symmetrical, it's not um, wonderful. But again, my kids didn't care, and this is how I got practice. This is how I learned. So this one is just I'm swirling in and swirling back out on my on itself, um, not right on top of the same line. And then you can see how I would work around. I did go right over the top of the applique. The applique was all done prior to being put on the long arm, and I went right over all of that. But uh, this is where I started. This is how it started. So just um, just almost kind of looks like wind, I guess, but just swirls, large swirls, small swirls, and um, that's how it started. So this was Maggie's, and I think this one was Emily's. Hers said Butler. We enjoyed going to some Butler um, games at uh, Hinkle Field House, if you're familiar with that, um, a couple times. And so again, this one was just fabrics that I had on hand. Here's some blue. This is, again, some denim. I even used a sweatshirt, look at this. I used the sweatshirt and I left the pocket from the sweatshirt on there so that she could have this on her bed and you know hide little things in there. I know the denim, this might have been from like a denim skirt or something, and I left the pocket on there. Now I didn't long arm over, over the pockets. I left those free um, and open, but the pocket's usable. She could stick something in there. And uh, you can do that when you're doing hand guided. It's a little more difficult unless you crop out the the, um, the area. You could do it on a digital where you crop out the area and not stitch on that part. But I was doing hand guided at this point. So this one says Butler all the way down, same kind of lettering. I uh, did the buttonhole stitch around each one. I always used steam a seam. That's how I did the letters. And for the quilting on this one, oh, here's another pocket you can see. So the quilting on this one, this is a cream color thread and I branched out and on this one, <laughs> literally, I did some flowers. And again, it's not, it's nothing super fancy. I, I came in, did a circle, did some flower petals, worked myself around. I did do the, the ribbon right here where you can see where I crossed over. I come in like a swirl, but then you cross back over and it looks like a ribbon that's um, folding over on itself and I would just do that a couple times off of the flowers 
and then move on to another one. So again, it's not beautiful, it's, but it's all part of my journey. This is where I started. My girls loved it. They still actually, when I pulled these quilts, I pulled them off their beds again. <laughs> so they're still being used today. And, um, and that's how it started. So don't be afraid just to start somewhere. The clarity comes in the doing. The more you do, you go, oh, that wasn't quite right. You get better at it. Your muscle memory gets better. You can doodle on marker board or, um, or on paper while you're sitting at the doctor's office. I always encourage you to hold the marker or your pen, whatever you're using on, using it, hold it like this because that's how you're holding the handles of the machine as you're doing it and um, draw like that so that the muscle memory gets into your brain and you just practice the same designs over and over and over and, um, and you get better and better, but this is early stuff. The third one I did was an Indiana quilt. Again, this is just large, um, just very large squares, super simple to do. It says Indiana, I did that in black. Um, it says Indiana in the, um, in the diagonal. A little bigger because Indiana's um, a little longer word than Butler or the Colts, so this one's a little bit bigger. Super simple, again, this one does have some dirt spots on it because it was out in the uh, mudroom, but again, I like my quilts to be used and um, this one was Holly's. Holly did not take this with her when she got married. She left it here. And you can see this one I used red thread. See how well it shows up there on the white. I did a lot of experimentation at the beginning and I encourage you to do that too. Today, I don't typically like to use red thread, uh, especially, but especially on a white fabric. I just would not do that today. I would prefer, and it works, it's fine. Um, I would prefer to have a, a white color thread and have it show up on the reds than the reds show up on the whites, if that makes sense. But I just did a loopy loop, very similar to what I did on that red and brown quilt from before. And a um, little tighter, it looks like, on this one. But again, this is just, just learning, just learning. Just make things and um, give them away, give them to your kids, your grandkids, they love it, and it's all, it's all part of your journey, it's all part of practice. So I think that is the last quilt that I brought today. So this is, this is a time period when I had my own long arm and I was not necessarily working um, for other people at this point. I'm just getting my feet underneath me and learning the machine and learning um, stitching. I am not necessarily an artist. I'm not one that sits and doodles or draws. So I really had to practice patterns until they got to the point that they were um, ingrained in my brain. And that's part of the reason I switched to digital when I did is because I realized, I felt like the industry was turning to digital. There were so many more designs and I could not practice a design long enough to get good at it, um, as it, as it could be done with the digital machine. Also, um, I was getting return customers over and over and I felt like I only had, you know, half a dozen dozen designs that I was proficient at and I didn't like to repeat designs on a customer's on a second quilt of theirs so I felt like I was maxing out my abilities with um, a hand guided machine if I was just working for myself I think it would have been fine um, but as I started working for clients I felt like the industry was moving to digital and that's the reason I sold my hand guided that was an HQ 16 if I didn't mention that before I bought my second machine also bought that one used um, it was a floor model that had been bought um, by someone and then she decided she didn't want to learn the digital side of it. It was too complicated. So I really purchased it. It was fairly new, had been recently um, um, serviced by a dealer, had been watched by a dealer very carefully. And so I did, did not buy it from the dealer, but from an individual. And this one, I bought an Amara with Pro Stitcher on it, and that's what I've been running since 2020. And then as you saw recently, I purchased a second Amara as well. Um, but that's how I got started and with a hand guided. I know many of you that watch are hand guided, and you just it's just practice. Don't be scared. Even if you're first starting digital, don't be scared. Um, the more you do, the better you get. If you just if you're scared and won't touch the machine, you're never going to get better. You're going to make mistakes. Things are going to happen. And um, I always laugh. I think when you know I watch golf on TV. I'm not a big golf watcher but when you watch golf on TV it's not that they never make mistakes right I mean they hit it off the side or they hit it in the sand trap it's that they know 
Um, they've done it enough and they know how to get out of those situations most of the time. So in your quilting, you're gonna make mistakes, but just know that you figure out how to get out of that mistake and how to make it right. And then the next time you try not to make that same mistake and you do it even better. So that's some of my journey. Next week I'll share some more. And you kind of, it's been fun as I've looked around the house and trying to figure out, okay, which quilt did I make first and which one comes next? To I can kind of see the progression in my quilting and it's been a fun experience to um, pull them out and really I need to go ahead and document them each not just here on um, on YouTube but to actually take pictures and document my journey as well and it'll be something that I can pass on down to my girls and family down the line um, when they're talking about great grandma and she used to sew you know and many of you have stories like that and um, and that's gonna be me someday so it'd be a great thing for me to go ahead and take pictures and and um, and just document what I did and why and when and all of that stuff. All right, let me clean this up and then we will move on to some updates on my personal sewing. One more thing before I move on to the quilts that I've worked on this week, I found my oldest UFO. And I just thought it might be fun for you to see this. So this quilt, I this has gotta be one of the very first quilts I ever worked on. It is a simple nine patch. Um, and then I can't tell you off the top of my head what this block is called, but it's got the four easy triangles so that you have the diamond inside the square. The whole quilt is that way. What held me up on this, um, the whole quilt is together. And then I decided to do embroidery in these white squares. I had never done embroidery before, machine embroidery. My mom had given me her old Bernina machine and it um, does embroidery. So I had this wild idea to do all these little um, scarecrow girls in all in the white um, going diagonally. And then in the other ones, you can see the ones that aren't done, I was going to do these cute sunflower. And I only have, you can see all the threads aren't even cut. Um, I only have two of these sunflower blocks done. One there and one there and all of the rest of them are not done. So in looking at it, I think all of the scarecrow girls are done, but I only have two of the sunflower blocks done. And so all of these others would need to be put on the machine and I still have the machine. I assume I still have the sunflower um, design. It has been so many years since I started on this. I really think I started on this prior to getting a long arm, and then once I got my long arm, that kind of got all my attention. You know, I was finishing quilts and putting them there, and I never came back to finish this embroidery. So, wow, this is super old. It's a nice big quilt. It would be really cute, but you tell me, should I go ahead and try to finish all of these embroidery blocks, figure that all out again? It has been so long since I've done embroidery, I'm not even sure I remember how to do it. I'm not great at it. <laughs> you can see I'm off on many of the blocks. My, um, you know, my girls are not square inside their, their little diamond there. But so you tell me in the comments, do you think I should go ahead and um, do all sunflowers and all of these in all of these white blocks? Should I leave the two that are there and just go ahead and long arm quilt the whole thing? Should I pull out the um, the two sunflower blocks that are done and so that it's all it looks nice I don't know you tell me what you think I should do and I'd love to get this finished because it's just it's just been sitting for all these years and we might as well finish it so you let me know what you think and um, and maybe I'll finish it so all right this week I have worked on my cottage temperature quilt so this is a free pattern by the fat quarter shop I do have all my information um, I'm still in the process of, of finding my system here. So I've got all my calendar pages in here and my um, works in progress in here, but it's really full at this point. So I think what I'm gonna do, I've purchased another binder and I'm gonna move my calendar out and just have my quilt projects in one and my calendar in another. But I do have my um, pattern. I am keeping my pattern for the cottage temperature quilt in, in this binder along with my notes about what fabrics I'm using, and um, let me just show you that real quick. So it just has notes of when I started 
and the fabrics I'm using, and then it has my color key right here that has the fabrics that they suggested for the pattern, and then the actual ones that I have chosen. I am using all Essex linen for mine, and then I have the rest of the pattern behind here. And I also have a printout of temperatures. So in the quilt, they do give you these sheets where you can fill out the temperature each day. I'm doing high temperature each day. You can decide whether you're doing high temperature and low temperature, one or the other, or you're doing average temperature, whatever you'd like to do. I'm using high temperature for the day, but instead of putting, instead of actually writing those down every day, I went on to the website. It's um, weather.gov or something. I'll link it down below, whatever the whatever it is that they suggested. And then I just hide, I look at my area, I highlight the table, and then I move this over to a Word document and printed it out. So it's really just this first line, but it gives me the date and it gives me the high temperature for that day. If you wanted to do low, it also gives low. And I don't remember what all these other numbers are, but you can look on the website and it will tell you. So then I'm printing this out at the end of the month and then that's how I am choosing my, um, or doing my blocks for each of the um, houses. So here's a picture of the pattern again. So each house represents one month and each block inside the house represents one day. Depending on the temperature for that day, the range of temperature for that day is the color of block that you are making. So they are all five um, degree increments, everywhere, everything from minus 15 all the way up to 106 plus. So all in five degree, I think they're all in five. Yep, everyone's in five degree increments, and then these are the actual fabrics that I have chosen. So I am using triangles on a roll for this as well. That is an It's So Emma product, and they come like this. I am using Essex linen, and I did um, fat quarter bundles of both a springtime one and of um, the, I guess it was the autumn, um, I'll link those down below as well. But I chose fat quarter bundles and then I chose fabrics from those to get all of the colors that I needed. I did some additional yardage for the houses and the trees and I'll show you those in just a minute. But here's some the additional yardage that I have. And then the fat quarters of some of the fabrics. So I have cut strips for the colors that I've started using. I cut strips of those and pair it with um, my white and then um, I stitch the triangles on a roll straight onto those. You're putting right sides together but with linen there's not necessarily a right and wrong side. How I judge it is looking at the selvage. I kind of look in which direction it's punched through um, but I don't know that there's necessarily a, a right or wrong side to linen. But. So then this is stitched very easy. If you start, you know, so I've done a, I've done a length enough um, to do as many as I could fit on here. I've cut two off the end already of these. But if you start at the arrows on one end, it, the, on the arrows is where, the arrows show you where to stitch at. And so I, you can go the entire length of this, all the way down, all the way down, all the way down, turn around, go all the way back up, and then do the same thing on the other side, and it's, you know, one continuous all the way through it. And then it's very important that you cut accurately. So triangles on a roll are great. They are giving you perfectly sized blocks. You can choose whatever finish size that you want. I am using um, two inch finished, but you have to be accurate in your cutting. If you're not accurate in your cutting, then it's gonna throw off the blocks because these finish at the absolute right size. Um, so far, I'm enjoying them. I don't know that, um, I don't have trouble with just joining two squares together, stitching them, cutting them apart, and then trimming up the block. I don't find that tedious. If you find that tedious and don't enjoy that process, you would probably very much like triangles on a roll. Because once you do this stitching and you cut on the solid lines, you press those open, your blocks are exactly perfect size. The only thing you would need to trim is the little dog ears that you get, um, but that would be it. So it's really your preference. I don't know that it's saving me much. I, it might be saving time because I'm doing so many at once. Um, 
but uh, I would say if you are if you are having trouble with um, regular piecing of two squares together and doing half square triangles that way or if you tend to do the bias where you're sewing on the bias I'd say give these a try you may like this a whole lot better and they have all different sizes so depending on what your pattern is that you're using you can get triangles on a roll in all those different sizes but this is how I'm doing it um, this time because I only needed a couple of the J I haven't cut all of these apart yet and you notice I do write the letter there you can see that I have given a letter to my pieces as well the reason I did that is so I can very quickly know which one I have and I don't have to keep going back okay so that green is this one you know I can very quickly look at the letter and know whether I have the right one or not so I have both January and February done so let me show you January I, I am loving this loving this so let me hold this up all right so this is the January block as you know January has 31 days the house only has 30 blocks in it so any month that has 31 you're making a tree that goes alongside the house and this is the color um, uh, for the temperature and that's the color you use in your tree so this temperature right here this was between 40 and 45 so the purples it's not sticking because I have another block behind there so the purples are your coldest colors then blues are you're getting a little warmer and then you can see we had a couple little green ones in here those are getting up into the 50s that the in there in January you know uh, which is pretty good for Indiana and then so this one would have been um, this temperature would have been between 40 and 45 so we had a really mild January and then you can see the darker browns up here for my house uh, the eaves and the chimney really love that little bit of sashing these are real skinny sashing pieces that go in between the houses and in between the trees so that is my January block and pull this off and you can see my February block. Look at all the colors. <laughs> we had some temperatures all over the place. So you have some colder ones down here um, with the purple. The blues are a little warmer, but you know, not even that many blues. This, this purple is in this um, teens, 20s, and then you've got some of these blues. Um, not that one. I don't even have one that's in the high 20s. But then we're getting into this color is in the 30s. Um, then we're getting into the 40s and then with the greens you're getting into the 50s and the yellows are actually 60s and this brightest yellow right here was a 70 degree day and that was in February so very colorful February for mine now you'll notice there is one brown square in here that's because February has this year it had 29 days so typically it would have 28 which would be um, you know there would be even more empty squares in there but so what fat quarter shop did is they just created one brown square right here you could say it's a tree or a tree you could say it's a, a window or what whatever you want to say but um, that just represents one day it's just not even a certain day it's um, so we have six seven they just picked the eighth day but it doesn't matter it could have gone anywhere in the quilt but because there are 29 then the other 29 squares are all filled out there's no tree next to this one because all of the dates are be able to fit into the house. So that is February. So we're reaching the end of March here. So once we hit the last day of March, then I will go to that website and I will print out all of the, um, I'll print out that table for the high temperatures for March and then I'll be able to work on this. So this is really gonna turn out to be like a, a block of the month type of deal for me. Um, you could do them each day if you wanted to. That's totally, um, um, doable that way my second half of my block is all white because I'm using that is the same background as um, the background of the house and all the sashing prints you could do a low temperature if you wanted to a high and a low that might be fun it's gonna be a lot more work um, and those would you wouldn't be able to do um, the triangles on a roll because you well you I guess you could but you're gonna have really smaller pieces because each one is gonna be different you're gonna have very few days that are gonna be exactly the same ranges between high and low so that might be a little more complicated but it would make a very pretty quilt as well 
So that's my February block. I'm loving this. I'm really enjoying it. And like I've mentioned before, I've seen temperature quilts, never really thought much about them, but I really like the houses. And I think it would be great somewhere on the quilt to put 2024, whether in the label on the back or something. It's just, uh, just a really neat representation. I can see this one being something you could do every year or a variation of it every year. Um, I don't know if you'd want to, but I can, this would be a quilt, you know, if you're not do, if you don't have time here in 2024, get the pattern and do it for 2025 because it will work any, any year that you want to do it. So really, really fun. All right. The other thing that I have been working on lately, um, is my Quilt Circle membership has been doing a quilt along this year and we are doing Somerville by Camille Roskelly. And let me grab that pattern. So Camille Roskelly has four patterns that uh, for each of the seasons and um, Quilt Circle chose, we did a vote at the beginning of the year, end of last year, and we chose the Somerville pattern. It has been so much fun to see um, in Quilt Circle all the different variations. We have people doing um, patriotic colors, reds and blues. We have those that are doing uh, more pastel colors. We have those that are doing similar to mine, which is more of a muted, um, colorway. We have some that have done instead of a white background, they've done a gray background. So it's, she calls it her twilight village. And so, so fun to see this. So um, I, I divided up the pattern to be worked on a little bit at a time, a little bit each week, but many people um, love to work monogamous where they only do one quilt at a time. So there have been several in our group that have already finished this but it has been a blast. If you are interested in joining the Quilt Circle membership, we will be opening membership up again, probably the last week of April, first week of May, sometime in that time period. There is um, a link down below where you can get on the wait list so that you'll be first to be notified when that membership does open. It will only be open for probably three or four days and then we close it again and and we only do that a couple times a year. And that's just so that we can create a cohesive group. We don't have a lot of influx in and out. That way we get to know each other. Quilt Circle membership is meant for isolated quilters. Perhaps you're not able to get out. Maybe you don't have a local quilt guild that you can be a part of. So it's meant for isolated quilters to find community, find inspiration, motivation, and it has been an absolute blast. We have people from all across the US, from Canada. We have even have some um, um, a member that's in South Africa. So it is so, so fun to get to know each other, to see everyone's talents, and this quilt along has been a blast to see everybody's different colorways. So let me show you what I've been working on. We started out by doing all of the border blocks, and that's the way the pattern goes. So the pattern has you doing the border blocks, then doing the four stars, four small stars, and then the middle stars, and then I think we start on the houses next. Some people are starting in and moving out. Um, you know, I just gave suggestions on how to work through the pattern, so I didn't want to confuse anybody. So I did start on the um, outer border, and these are the blocks that I have chosen. Color-wise, I am using um, pretty much reproduction type, um, I don't know for reproduction, some are Kim Deal prints, um, and I'll link them down below. I don't have all of the, I don't have all the fabrics memorized, what I was using. I know some of them are from Kim Deal's new line, uh, and then I, I chose fat quarters that kind of matched them. So my border is going to be red and blue. So here are my red and blue ones. This goes all the way around the quilt. And then my corners are gonna be this mustard color. All right, so let me show you the pattern again so you can see. So all of these, now you'll notice on the pattern, Camille has you doing three easy corner triangles. So like you can see on this light blue, there are three easy corner triangles and then the dark blue, three easy corner triangles. I chose not to do that. Instead, I'm just doing two easy corner triangles. These will be around the outside of the quilt so that the inside edge of, um, of this border will just be solid. It will be red and, and blue, um, similar to, so this. Mine will look like this. If you added the third one in there, then you would have in between every other block, you would have you know a little piece there. And I just didn't want to do that. Some people in our group are doing, um, just using, using yardage and not doing pieced blocks for their, their 
border. Some are just waiting till the end to decide what to do. So I have all of those blocks done. And then for my small, four small stars, these are my four small stars. So um, red and black and green and yellow. These are half square triangles that I did the traditional way, putting of layering a light fabric with a dark fabric, stitching across on either side of the diagonal and then pressing open. And that's those two. I have a different color print for the middle star. Uh, you know, this green is different from this green, but they coordinate. This red is different from that red, but they coordinate. And then I did make sure that I did them the same direction on all four of the stars. And you can see them all lined up there. Love the colorway, really like it. And then there is one large star. So those smaller ones measure 12 and a half, I believe. And here is the large star. If this gives you an idea of the size of this quilt, here's the large star. And I believe the large star measures 24 and a half. So I don't have this the same. There. <laughs> now it looks the same as those others. So this is 24 and a half inches, exact same way, made the exact same as the smaller stars, just with larger pieces. I did have one directional print, so I had to make sure that this one was always oriented the same direction. And some in our group are doing different things even with their stars. So some are using the same color or the same fabric for the points as for the inner part. Some people are making the whole middle one color and then different colors for the outside. So, so many variations. So when you look at a quilt pattern, tweak it to your likes, you know, or maybe to the fabrics that you have or to how much yardage you have. You, you're certainly able to um, to work a pattern to, to fit your needs, but so excited. This has been so, so much fun to be a part of. So I will link Camille's pattern down below. Somerville, like I said, she has one for each season, all just, all in the same um, similar, but all with little different nuances um, depending on the season. So a lot of fun. So that's been my personal sewing for this week. How about we start with some customer quilts? So my first few quilts here have already gone home. You will recognize this quilt I did. This is the second, actually I'm gonna show you two of the same quilt today and I've, I've done a third one several weeks ago. These are quilts from my uh, local quilt guild that uh, this was the block of the month from last year. I did not participate in this, but several people did and now I'm starting to get some of those quilts in to be quilted. And this first one was done by Mary Lynn and she used all batiks. This pattern is called Colorful Tropics. It was designed by Barbara, I'm not gonna get this name right, by, by Regal maybe, and there's a link down below where you can see the pattern itself. This includes foundation paper piecing, this includes applique, this includes um, traditional piecing. It does have a whole piano key border around the outside. A little tricky if you're long arming because that thing likes to stretch. So good advice um, if you're doing on any quilt then you have a lot of seams around the outside edge, just do a stay stitch all around the very edge of your quilt just to keep everything from pulling apart and from stretching too much when it's on the long arm. Quilt I did a couple weeks ago was for Jane, the very same pattern, but she actually added a white border all around, you know, more like another another border around on the outside of that piano key, and it was really pretty too. So you wanna go back a couple weeks and find that one and kind of compare the two. So Mary Lynn's did, Mary Lynn did um, all batiks, a little brighter batiks than the next one I'm gonna show you, and uh, very pretty, very summery feel. She did a white backing fabric to this, and then she used, she wanted the ginger snap pantograph. So a lot of swirls, a lot of softness added into the quilt. We used a white thread so that it blends seamlessly with that white background and especially the white um, backing fabric on the back side of it. So a very large quilt. Let me see if I can find the measurements. Waiting for the trash guys to finish. 
So fairly large quilt. This quilt, Mary Lynn's quilt, measures 74 by 88, so a really nice quilt. So here is Sandy's version of the same quilt. So again, the exact same pattern, foundation paper piecing, it has traditional piecing, it has applique. Sandy's batiks, um, just a little more um, subtle than Mary Lynn's were, still a very beautiful quilt. If you notice for the backing fabric is a bright rainbow wave print. It's very pretty, adds a whole new dimension to the quilt. And it's so fun to get quilts that are uh, the same pattern and to see the differences just by changing a backing fabric or changing the pantograph. Um, little differences can make a big difference in a quilt and all to your liking. I mean, that's what's so fun about quilting. It can be done to your liking. So Sandy chose the geoflower pantograph. She said I, she didn't want softness or swirls, no flowers. Um, not traditional flowers. So this is called geoflower and I really like the way this turned out. It adds a more modern feel to the quilt, which I think is a lot of fun, which very much complements the backing fabric that she chose, which has much more of a modern feel, um, more so than the traditional white backing uh, fabric that Mary Lynn chose. So very neat. I love this pantograph. It nests really well. I believe we talked about this one last week too. Use the white thread that blends in really well with everything and um, like the way this nests together. And again, you can bring it up close so that all those points would touch. I don't necessarily think that it has to be done that way. This design looks really, really nice without having to um, fussy all of those, um, those little points along the way. So really like this one. So Sandy's about the same size, 76 by 91. Again, that piano key border around the outside and just a lot of fun, a lot of fun to see this one. Very nice work. So also in my local quilt guild this year, I've been in charge of the challenge committee again. And last year we did a UFO challenge. This year we decided to do a pre-cut and panel challenge. So each month the members are challenged to either use a specific pre-cut like fat quarter bundle or a layer cake or jelly roll um, or a specific panel. And so for February, uh, the challenge was to use um, some sort of a love panel or a, a Valentine's Day theme and Joyce decided to make her own kind of panel. She chose the fat, the background fabric that you see and then she put three applique hearts on it for Valentine's Day and or just uh, the loves in her life and uh, uh, she made it into a wall hanging. So for the um, pantograph, I asked her if we could go with this iCat pantograph. I thought this just needed a lot of texture. It was a fun um, quilt, you know, wall hanging. It needed some, just some punch there, I felt like. And I felt like the iCat really just added a lot of dimension. Um, kind of echoed the same, you know, it kind of had those movements in the, in the backing fabric, the background fabric behind those hearts. You know, just kind of a gentle um, sway in it. I don't know if that's the right thing to say, but, uh, just thought this eye cap pantograph, and especially, I don't think I have a picture of it, but the backing fabric was that peacock, kind of iridescent um, purple and blue that we've, we've, I've seen many times on different kind of quilts. And, um, and that kind of gave me the idea of the peacock. The eye cap kind of gives you the, the feel of a peacock. So, so no, there's no peacock per se on the front, but with that kind of a hint on the back and then just the texture and the, the movement of that background behind the hearts, just um, I asked, you know, I said, Joyce, this is the first thing I think of when I see this. And she loved it when she got this quilt back. She just absolutely um, loved it as well. 
and um, the stitching goes right over the applique and actually anytime you have a little bit um, I, I'd say if you have a little bit um, maybe some ripples in either applique or in um, a little bit of extra fabric when I want to say in a border or something sometimes it's better to go a little denser with your pantograph um, because the the density of a pantograph kind of shrinks in your material meaning it is just there's so much there that it that it pulls it in and so between using you know best press to try to best press is a sizing that if I have a lot of ripples in a border or something I will spray the best press and press it with a hot iron and that'll tend to get a lot of um, that extra fullness out um, but I know in this this wall hanging there was some extra fullness in those hearts and by doing a very dense pantograph it really just just um, shrunk everything down enough that it added all that texture and it just it makes everything lie flat and look really really nice so sometimes we kind of get the idea that it would be the opposite that if there's a lot of um, you know some extra fullness that we should go lighter and I, I tend to think the opposite I tend to think that if we have um, more um, some more fullness that sometimes between the tricks of best press and and those things that to do a tighter design and it kind of holds everything you do have to watch for some rippling there have been instances like I mentioned earlier you know a golfer isn't that he hits perfect every time it's that he knows how to make get out of mistakes and so there are times when sometimes when there's some extra fullness and uh, the fabric ends up getting um, creased over that I have had to pull out some stitches and use the best press again and and try to get that you know finagle it so it's a little more even in the fullness but um, just work with it and and just kind of think maybe a little tighter design if you've got some fullness there but that's also um, in adding borders on your fabric or on your quilts I always say the math is the perfect thing to use not necessarily just slapping on uh, a two and a half inch border and trimming it off at the end that's not always the best way so if you have a pattern and they figured out the math and you know the math is good I'd follow the numbers on the pattern and um, your math is going to be right so uh, that's usually the best way to add borders and the other thing I do is don't when you're adding borders this is totally off you know the wall hanging but when you're adding borders is um, not to just start at one end and and stitch all the way to the other end I always um, when I'm adding a border I will fold the quilt in half so that I find that halfway point I'll fold the border in half so I find the halfway point on that border match those up and then I do it again for the quarter and the three quarters inch on them so that that way even if your border is not the exact same as um, you know say your piecing's a little off or your borders a little off in the measurements that you cut or that when you stitch if you um, if you've got a little extra it's going to spread that that little bit extra out over the entire length of that quilt and again I stitch with pins I leave my pins in I run over my pins um, probably shouldn't tell you that but I do I like pinning I like I like those precise things and so especially adding a border I will that kind of keeps the whole border in where it needs to be and instead of pushing all that fullness to one to one end and then and then it is not laying right when you're um, ready to quilt it so my two cents that's it all right so let's move on um, to Sharon's quilts Sharon's first quilt is called Francisca Fox. This is a pattern by Fig Tree and Company. This is so cute. I had so much fun quilting this. This is just adorable. All of the fabrics are also, also from Fig Tree and Company. This is the cinnamon and cream line. So lots of melon, um, brown cinnamon colors, and your oranges, and just adorable. I love the sashing in this. So in between each of the Francisca Fox you have the three lines of sashing the green in the middle and then the cornerstones are these adorable little flowers these are very small pieces 
but each one is a snowball block. E the fo each fourth of this flower is a snowball block where you're adding easy corner triangles onto that. Look how tiny that is. <laughs> so, so tiny. Uh, but it makes it just an adorable um, cornerstone with the flower right there and the green sash work. The, um, you can see the border around the edge is this um, floral print. The backing is the green floral so so pretty each one of the foxes are different they have little blue little um, black noses and their little black paws and let me pull this in closer so you can see one of them just adorable love their tails and the tip of their tail their ears just adorable and she did all of them a brown or you know, a, an orange, more of the brownish parts to the lines as compared to the um, the melon color of the florals, of the flowers. So pretty, just adorable. And here's a close up of the backing fabric, still part of that line. So pretty. So Sharon asked about Baptist fan for this one, and I think it is so adorable. Now, because this quilt is a smaller quilt, it measures 57 by 57. It's obviously very dainty and a feminine feel. And so the Baptist fan pantograph, because of the scale of the foxes, because of the scale of the, of the um, pattern itself, I did this one fairly small. So you can see how tight I did that Baptist fan. I just felt for the scale of it, it needed to be small. So, um, you know, in between each one of these little fans, it's not even the, you know, to my first knuckle on my finger. It's how, how tiny it was. This is called Easy Baptist Fan. This is done by Three Sisters Fabric. The pantograph is, I love this one. I think it, um, this is a pretty precise lineup point. And um, right here is where they would line up. So I, when I orient it, I never quite bring this point to touching this top um, of the fan. And then you can adjust using your um, batting scraps and things like I showed last week in getting that line exactly perfect. My, t my machine tends to stitch up just a little higher than it actually shows on the machine or on the screen. And you'll just have to learn your machine to see if it actually stitches where it says it's stitching. But I've learned over time that mine stitches just a tad bit higher than it actually looks on the screen. So if I keep that, um, that spacing a little bit more, I know that it's going to creep up a little bit and uh, just about touch. So it's, there's maybe a millimeter or two in between that point. Um, but then everything else, it's stitching in that row. And so they're exact points. It's just that very top point and um, lots of practice and you can you can get that one love the daintiness of this one so this one is a um, this is a cream color thread so even though this is fairly white um, fabric here the cream color um, just the whole tone of the quilt is seen more of a cream color than a white color and again it's to it, I can't give hard and fast rules. I lay out both and I try to see which one I like better. This one, the cream one, looked a little better. The white is not a solid white um, fabric. It's got little dots of all of the other prints, of all the other colors in there. So the cream blended well with that and then it's not so bright on all the browns, but it's obviously noticeable. But um, love all the texture it adds to that. All right, let's move on to Sharon's second quilt. second quilt is called Vintage Kite and this is actually a free pattern by It's So Emma in the Fat Quarter Shop. I've linked this down below. So Vintage Kite uses foundation paper that is created by It's So Emma to get these um, this points that you see here. So foundation paper very similar to the triangles on a roll where you are layering your fabrics and then um, it's, it's a little different than triangles on a roll because triangles on a roll you're layering two 
you're layering both fabrics and then doing all the stitching. Where foundation paper piecing, you are laying one fabric on, you're doing that stitching, you're pressing that back, you're laying your next fabric on, and then doing that stitching. But that's how you can get these angles for this vintage kite. Very nice. The fabrics that she has used on this are, are called Create by Alley K Designs and also some rustic gatherings. So all grays and blacks and they, they blend very well together. The white fabric then, uh, so here is the block, the vintage kite block. But you can see where it meets up with the next one then you get this um, octagon shape here with the whites. This is not a solid white, it is part of that fabric line, so um, very similar to um, some of the florals, but it's a very, it's a white on white, so you re it's a tone on tone. You really don't notice it until you get up close. Then it has a couple borders, very, you know, she did it just exactly as the pattern does. You have a skinny border, a wider border, you have cornerstones on each corner, and she did black on the corners the gray larger border, a black inner border, and then her background is a black as well, all from that same line. Very pretty. This quilt measures 64 by 76. Now for this one, I did choose a gray thread. Um, and again, is because the tone of the quilt is a really gray, quilt and even though there's a lot of white prints in here I didn't feel like the tone of the quilt is a light and bright quilt it's a more more a subdued and subtle quilt so I did choose a light gray thread so it's not overpowering on the white but it continues that the feel of a gray subdued masculine more quilt even though it is florals um, I feel like that this would be a, a a nice masculine or a nice farmhouse, modern farmhouse type quilt. Um, the two lines of the Create and the Rustic Gatherings blend very well. They're, they're used interchangeably in these blocks. The pattern calls for layer cakes, and I believe it's two, um, two 10 inch stackers or layer cakes, and then also 40 fat quarters for all of these. So you could obviously use yardage as well too. Um, so a lot of, a lot of fabrics really, it feels like. So a lot of seams, this one, you can see the pantograph. I chose the eye cap pantograph again. And, um, with the vintage kite, I thought it had kind of that pointy feel to it. The eye cat adds a little more of curviness, but, but maintaining that theme of the, of the pointiness to it. It's not super huge. We've done this, um, not quite as tight as was on the heart wall hanging, but fairly small too. I wanted to keep it um, similar to the size of the um, of the kite itself. The kite, I think this is six inch foundation paper. So the the height of the eye cat is probably four or five inches. So um, not the exact same as the kite, but but similar in size. I didn't want something super huge, kind of keeping it oriented to the size of the the design in the quilt itself. So it turned out really, really pretty. Let me bring this in just a tad bit closer so that you can see the pantograph. Adds a lot of texture, especially in those white areas. And even though it's a light gray thread, I don't think it's uh, super, it doesn't darken the quilt. I think it just keeps the same gray tone to the quilt. Very pretty. All right, here are pictures of the next one. This next one is Elizabeth's Jelly Roll Race. Jelly Roll, Jelly Roll Race Quilt. And um, I have quilted several of these Jelly Roll Races, but have never really looked up how it's made. And this is pretty interesting. So what you do is you take a Jelly Roll, which are the two and a half inch strips, usually 40, 42 in, um, in a package, you know, in one of the rolls. And you 
um, stitch that entire jelly roll together end to end. So you will have this humongously long two and a half inch strip, very long. You do it on diagonal seams, and let me show you one of those diagonal seams. So you can see here, you do it in a diagonal seam. So you're gonna have some places where here's a dark and a light next to each other. Other times it's like here's two grays or two blues next to each other, not quite so noticeable. But when it does change from one color to the next, you, you notice it. So all of those, um, strips are joined with a diagonal seam um, all end to end and then what you do is you join the two ends of that you fold over the two ends of the jelly roll strip that you have now created and you sew down the entire length of one of it and then clip it at the end where that fold is and then you fold that in half again um, and stitch that one and over and over and over until you get the desired length so um, really fun, really fun. And she's done a really nice job of keeping everything straight. It's not always the easiest to do, especially if you have directional prints, um, but she's done a really nice job on it. So the backing fabric, oh, first of all, so the fabric for this one, this is Springbrook by Cora Yoder of Coriander Quilts. That's a Moda design. Love the blues and the yellows, the grays, and you got some darker grays in here too, just super, super pretty. So for the backing fabric, she chose this gray Shannon Cuddle Minky. This is in the color Alloy. Love the gray. I think it really complements the front really, really nicely. So you can see the pantograph. Pantograph is again Baptist fan. This is larger than it was on the Fox quilt because the feel of this one is not quite so tight. It's a little bigger than that one was, and so I increased it a little bit, not tremendously, but it's obviously noticeable. This is one that, um, as you increase it, it doesn't take very much of an increase to get a larger Baptist fan. So really love that. The thread on this one is, it's a white thread. Now I know the backing, the back is gray, but on a minky, the thread does not show on the back. On the front, I felt like this one was more light, um, sunshiny yellows, and so the white thread I felt went um, better. This background, you've got a lot of white fabrics that are white with very little, um, there's little bumblebees on here, but not a lot. Um, and just felt like the white thread went, went better with this one. Very pretty. I love the minky. You can really see the design on the on the minky. It just soaks right in. Very nice, Elizabeth. All right, let's move on to a Christmas quote. Jane's Christmas quilt measures 66 by 71. I'll see if I can get some information about the pattern. I don't um, don't have that information at the time. So a very fun Christmas quilt. Love the background fabric that's the dark black. So it's a solid black, like a moda black. And then your reds and greens are all batiks. So really fun. Um, just like the difference in that, how it changes the whole look of a quilt by doing the dark background. So you have Christmas trees, you have blocks, um, you know, some traditional piece blocks. You have some ornaments in the in the quilt. Very pretty. All the reds and greens she's getting all ready for Christmas. Love the pinwheels. So we did do the binding on this one as well. And um, that's a service that we offer if you are interested in that also. So you can see the pantograph on this one is called mistletoe. And love the swirliness of this one. Love the... Um, Oh, just, I love the look of mistletoe. I think it's a very pretty, fun design. It doesn't necessarily have to be for Christmas, but I thought it went really well with this Christmas quilt. For the quilting, I did use a gray thread, and um, it is a light gray thread. I didn't go with the darker gray. I thought it um, would be too dark on this, so it does show up really well on this, And um, but it is a gray, not a white. That way you can see all the quilting. I think it adds a nice dimension, a nice, fun, festive um, feel to the quilt. And um, love this one. Just love the way this stitches out. 
Part of the reason I used mistletoe was because of the backing fabric. The backing fabric had all of these swirls in it. Um, it's a green with the white swirls, but you have little dots of red all through it too. And that was really the inspiration. I thought if um, Jane gave me free leeway to use whatever design I wanted, but knowing that she had picked out this um, fabric for the back that had a lot of swirls, then I thought that that was a good combination to put the swirls on the front of the quilt, just to kind of echo that same theme. Um, if she had chose a different backing fabric that maybe it was a little more modern or a little more square, then that would have given me an indication of the feel that she had when she saw this quilt. When, um, when the backing fabric has these swirls, then I know, okay, she's, she's more comfortable with um, the feel of swirls and things on this quilt top. Even though the quilt top itself is very angular, by the backing fabric she picked out, it gave me an indication that um, the swirls would be nice on the front. So different, you know, somebody asked me the other day, how do you pick a design? The, the inspiration can come from so many different places. So sometimes it's in the fabrics, sometimes it's in the pattern, sometimes it's in the backing fabric, sometimes it's um, the quilt has a real strong theme and I just want to add some texture. Sometimes the quilt doesn't have much, um, much of a theme, you know, what it needs um, a theme added to it, you want to say. So it just really depends. I would look at your quilt and kind of get inspiration from different spots. Sometimes, you know, like this time it was the whole backing fabric. Sometimes it can be one fabric in the quilt top and you pull a design off of that and uh, emphasize that over the entire quilt. So just try different things and it really different people like different things. Um, and it's just as important for you to tell me I don't want this as it is to tell me I do want this. So if there are certain things, you know, like when Sandy gave me her quilt, she says, I don't want spirals. Perfect. So that, that just cuts out a whole section of pantographs and I can focus on other ones. So, and, um, and it's your quilt. So I want you to decide and, and give me an indication. I can give you ideas. I can tell you what I see in the quilt, but sometimes your idea is totally different and I want I want to hear that and um, and help you out to get that accomplished so all right Jane's quilt is all done and we have one more today Last quilt today is Elaine's quilt and this is the So Scrappy Spools. This was a quilt along that Fat Quarter Shop did last year. It is a pattern that was designed by Lori Holt and um, I will link that down below. The quilt along itself was free. The pattern you didn't need to pay for. So um, anybody could participate as long as you had the pattern. I guess I'll say it that way. So love this quilt. As you know I've done the same quilt. Mine's waiting to be long-armed um, and eventually it will be done but I just love these every time they come in. So Elaine said that she chose a lot of the fabrics in the spools are um, scraps that she had. Many of them were thimbleberry, and, um, but she's used scraps from other things as well. And then she said the spool ends, this was the spool ends and also the um, on either sides of the spools in the spool block itself. Those were some fabrics she picked up from Joanne Fabrics. And then you might recognize the sashing here and along the border. This is a Lori Holt print called Stitch. I think this is the cutest idea for your border because it has all of those, um, the words in there from, from the spool. So you have create and you have sew and you have crochet, you have fabric, you have hook. You have measure and stitch and spool and thread and happy place and sew. It's just so fun. So she's taken the whole theme of the quilt and um, put that in the border as well. So the spools, very pretty. So each one alternates back and forth. You have a horizontal one, then a vertical one. Some of them obviously needed to be vertical. And um, if you have not done this pattern yet and are wanting to, do be sure to look, because like the heart, there are um, three or four heart blocks throughout the quilt, but there are times when the, the heart needs to be oriented in the quilt. It needs to be put into the spool horizontally because the way it goes into the quilt. So just be notice, notice that some of the blocks don't matter 
you know, like um, a cross one like this doesn't matter so much, but a flag one and the heart one, um, some of those you'll need to make sure that you have oriented the correct way. The backing fabric is adorable. Look at this, this cream color fabric. It has all of this vintage sewing machines and threads and tape measures and sewing tables and pins. Oh, I love this fabric. Let me see, Elaine said this is a Dan Morris design from 2022 from QT Fabrics. Ah, oh, I love this. This would be so pretty as, um, as a project bag or something like that. I just, I love this fabric. The oil can't, oh, the little sewing machine. I have a little sewing machine like that. Just so, so pretty. Little words, like a like part of a letter, the script, very pretty. So for the pantograph, Elaine said um, she wanted to stay more traditional. She said, I normally, you know, just like Baptist fan or something like that. Um, and so I suggested something very simple, but that would add, maybe pull her out of her comfort zone just a little bit, but not just repeating the same thing that she's always done. So this one is just a wave design. It's um, about an inch apart, the spacing of it. And I don't remember the name of this one off the top of my head. I will link it down below once I look it up. This, so this design stitches out just one line over the next. On my machine, I was able to program it so it would do four lines. So it would stitch once, and then it would stitch it back, and then it would go across again, and then it would come across again. And that's a little more time saving for me that I don't have to stand there and once it gets to the end, pull it back every time. So by it doing four, time, four passes across the quilt, um, now the only thing I had to make sure of was that my auto jump was not on because the auto, typically if you have, if on, these are on handy quilters, if you have an auto jump, you can set it how far. So if, if I say I want auto jump anything that's within two inches. So if it finishes up at one spot and the start point, the next start point is less than two inches away, it'll automatically jump to that one and start stitching. And a lot of times I'll do that, especially across the top of the quilt. I'll just set an auto jump so it can continue to do um, points across the top. But then typically you'll have a start point on the left side and your end point on the right, and it's a very long jump, so it doesn't auto jump. With this pattern though, because it stitches back, it stitches across and back, across and back. So your start and your end points are all on the left-hand side of the quilt which is great, except if I get close to my bars down here and it tries to auto jump, but there's not, um, because the auto jump is within that two inches or six inches, whatever you have it automatically set at, it, the computer thinks it's got room to go on farther down, but if, you're, if your machine is at the edge of the bar, it's gonna hit those bars thinking it can go farther. So I actually turned my auto jump off when I did this quilt so that it wouldn't, I wouldn't have any of those you know, moments where, oh no, it's trying to move and it, it shouldn't. That way it would stitch out the four rows and then it would stop. And then I would start it again if I had room for the next four. And I would start it again if I had room for the next four. But at some point then I needed to rotate the quilt. So just be aware of that if you have starts and stops on the same side of the quilt. So the thread, this is a cream color thread. So the backing fabric was a very cream color print. The front, um, even though the Lori Holt print is more of a white, the the tone of these fabrics, the thimbleberry, the thimbleberry scraps and things, they're more of a toned down, muted colorway. And so I felt like the cream worked much better. And um, even on the light print of the Lori Holt print, like you can see it still blends in really well. So love the texture it gave to this quilt. It keeps the focus on the spools and is just adding the texture onto it. So a really nice design, really like this. So Ellen will be excited to get this back and get the, the binding on it. So the So Scrappy Spools ends up 72 by 90. So it's a fairly large quilt. Love the blocks in this and uh, just so fun to work on. So if you are in need of long arm quilting services, I hope you will contact me. My information is down below and I will be back next week with more customer finishes as well as my own personal projects because every quilt is worth finishing. We'll see you next week.